In 1828, a man arrived in San Antonio, and no man messed with him or stood in his way because his reputation had preceded him. The Tejanos of San Antonio already knew who he was because they had read about him in magazines and newspapers, and he looked exactly as they had imagined. This newcomer to the Spanish city of San Antonio was a man history remembers as James, or Jim Bowie. Some say he was the baddest bad boy ever to step foot in Texas and was known to wield a mean knife. Welcome to TVC History. My name is Alex Andrew, your host and history ambassador. And today we have to talk about James Bowie and about the event in his life that some say made him a legend. Join me today as I present to you our video presentation entitled, The Man Who Brought a Knife to a Gunfight. First, let me welcome you if this is your first time on our TBC page. You're at the right place if you love Texas revolutionary history. We're glad you're here. So please hit the like and subscribe buttons and become part of our family. Additionally, if you don't want to miss out on any future videos, hit the bell notification button right now so you can catch all our stories. And finally, support our page and efforts by purchasing your copy of our book, Tejano Volunteer Company, Stories of Our Texas Revolution by J.L. Gonzalez, available on Kindle, paperback, and hardcover. Now let's get back to our presentation. Jim's legend began with a genuinely epic knife fight between James Bowie and Major Norris Wright, who was Jim's nemesis, right before Jim came to Texas. Now when I say epic, I'm not just throwing that word around loosely. James Bowie the man was as tough as nails. To understand the significance of this knife fight in history, we must go back a few years before the knife fight that became famous as the Sandbar Fight in 1826. Jim Bowie lived in Louisiana, and at that time Jim had a friendship and a business relationship with an older Southern gentleman. His name was Samuel Levi Wells III in Natchez, Mississippi. Bowie supported San Wells' run for sheriff of Rapidas Parish. Wells was well-known and well-respected and a major political force in Natchez. But, as is in politics, Wells had a political rival, and his name was Dr. Thomas Harris Maddox, who was also a major political force in Natchez. Wells and Maddox were like the Natchez political version of the Hatfields and the McCoys. One day, Bowie needed a bank loan and was turned down. One of the bank directors denied his loan because the banker was a Maddox supporter and Jim was a Wells supporter. This banker also spread rumors or truths about Jim Bowie's business dealings around town. This banker's name was Norris Wright, the current sheriff of Rapidas Parish. Norris Wright was known as Major Norris Wright. Everyone with wealth or position in the South at that time had a military rank prefix, whether they served in the military or not. So Jim's nemesis was Major Norris Wright. Jim heard about the rumors and went looking for Major Norris Wright to confront him about these rumors and found Wright in Alexandria. An argument ensued and suddenly Norris Wright lost it. He physically attacked and assaulted Jim Bowie without warning or notice, catching Jim off guard. First, Wright beat him down with his cane like a dog in the street scuffle. Then while Bowie was down, Wright stood back a step, pulled his pistol, took aim, and shot at Bowie, but missed. Bowie rolled out of the way at the last second in front of everyone present. Jim was humiliated. When Jim Bowie left that fight wounded and hurt, he swore, I will never be caught without a good weapon again. That afternoon when Bowie got home, he told his brother Rizin the story. Rizin ran into his room and came back with a piece of paper. He showed Bowie a picture of a knife design. The next day, Jim and Rizin went to the local blacksmith, Jesse Clift. They commissioned him to forge this lethal weapon designed by Rizin Bowie, and that knife would later become world-renowned as the Bowie knife. And once in his hands, Jim always left home with his trusty knife. Eventually, the two political leaders insulted each other to the point that the only solution was to settle this with a gentleman's pistol duel. Sam Wells III versus Dr. Thomas H. Maddox. History remembers that Sam Wells chose Jim Bowie as his second, a big honor with equally significant responsibility. Dr. Maddox chose Major Norris Wright, Bowie's nemesis, as his second. I can't make this stuff up. On September 19, 1827, James Bowie and Major Norris Wright attended the duel on a sandbar of the Mississippi River because duels were outlawed in their county. At 10 a.m., Bowie and duelist Samuel Wells entered the sandbar carrying their pistols, followed by their supporters or backup and doctors. Minutes later, Wright arrived with Dr. Thomas Maddox, their weapons, and their group. 
tensions were high between the two groups. Wright brought people with him that could fight. Wright had told his supporters that Bowie was the prime threat. There was a lot of hate between Bowie and Wright. Finally, the duel official broke the awkward silence between the two groups and officially commenced that duel of honor. Now, Sam and Tom, you know how this works. You two gentlemen will stand back to back here. On my mark, take 10 paces. Turn and shoot. In the middle of the opposing groups, Wells and Maddox stood back to back, took 10 paces, turned, aimed, and fired. They both missed. But it did shake these old southern gents a little. They both had to take a recess to regroup and prepare to repeat the duel. Duel rules state that if both miss, repeat step one. After several minutes, Wells and Maddox repeated the ritual. Then, they fire at each other a second time. They missed again. Since the duelists fired two shots and missed, and as neither man was injured and just grazed, they decided to resolve their duel with a handshake. Really? If you didn't catch that, both duelists took two shots at each other. Both duelists missed twice. And both duelists shook hands and considered their issue resolved. At this point, the story should be over, but this is where it starts to get good. At this point in the story, the people who showed up to this duel were disappointed at the results. However, they were restless and wanted to see some bloodshed. Think back to high school fights. Everyone is so excited. They want to see indiscriminate bloodshed. They want to see their buddy win. But these people got no carnage or bloodshed. They got a handshake. When the time came for the two teams to exit the sandbar, both duelists, Sam Wells and Dr. Maddox, turned to leave. And as they were leaving the sandbar, Jim Bowie came forward to meet and join them. Seeing this, Maddox's friends also ran ahead to join the group. And as they were walking and mean mugging each other, two men in this group who had previously fought and still had an ongoing issue to settle, stopped and looked at each other intently. One man was named General Cooney, and the other was Colonel Crane. General Cooney is recorded as calling out to Crane. Crane, this is a good time to settle our difficulty. Immediately and instinctively, Crane drew his pistol aimed and fired, missing General Cooney, who moved out of the way. But instead, Crane's musket ball struck Bowie on the hip or lower abdomen, and a force knocked him to the ground. Cooney and Crane then exchanged shots again. This time, Colonel Crane received a flesh wound to his left arm, and General Cooney was mortally wounded from a shot in the chest. Bowie was furious that he had been shot, and rising to his feet, drew his large knife and charged at Colonel Crane, the man who shot him. Still, Colonel Crane, also a badass, didn't move, he just took a defensive stance, and then perfectly timed his defensive response to the charging Bowie. When Bowie came within range, Colonel Crane swung his now empty pistol with all his might and struck Bowie very hard on his head. It was a dead-on hit. With that force, the pistol broke and sent Bowie to his knees with a big knot on his forehead. Then, at that moment, Major Norris Wright, Bowie's nemesis, saw his opportunity to kill Bowie in the melee. So Wright drew his pistol and shot at the fallen and disoriented Bowie. Missing because Bowie saw him aiming and rolled perfectly out of the way at the opportune moment. Then, before Bowie could recover, history remembers that Major Norris Wright drew a sword from his cane and charged at Bowie and successfully stabbed Bowie in the chest with that cane sword. Bowie's sternum deflected the thin blade through his chest and punctured his left lung. Bowie had received several critical injuries by this early stage of the fight. First, he was dazed from a blow to his head and received a gunshot to his hip. And now, he had a sword in his chest. What Bowie did next is what has made him a legend. If you were a betting man, and you were there watching this fight, you would have bet everything on Major Norris' right to win. Because at that moment, Wright was standing over a very injured, disoriented, and fallen Bowie. Finally, Wright put his boot on Bowie's chest to retract his sword blade free, just like a bullfighter at the end of the bullfight, and go for the coup de grace in front of everyone watching. Suddenly, and without notice, Bowie sprang to life, came to his senses, and went on the offensive. Jin reached up, grabbed Wright by his belt, pulled him down upon the point of his Bowie knife, and gutted him instantly, wildly, and with extreme prejudice. Human innards flew everywhere. By some accounts, Wright's heart was sliced violently out of his chest cavity at that moment. History remembers that Major Norris Wright died quickly. Some say, while he was still standing. As Bowie attempted to get on his feet, with Wright's sword still protruding from his chest, he was shot and stabbed again by other members of Wright's group. 
Moments later, Bowie finally stood up and attempted to pull the sword from his chest when two more of Wright's men, the Blanchard brothers, aimed their loaded pistols and fired at him. One shot struck Bowie in the arm. Then, one of the Blanchard brothers ran and lunged at Bowie as wrestlers do. But Booby saw him flying towards him through his peripheral and instinctively spun around to meet him, swinging his blade and cutting part of that man's ah! arm, almost clean off. And just like that, James Booby had turned into an 1800s version of Chuck Norris and annihilated everyone and everything in his path with his knife. When the dust settled 10 minutes after the fight started, the surviving spectators could not believe their eyes. They saw a badly injured and bloody Jim Booby, still standing. He stood surrounded by pieces of human body parts that lay around him, and according to some accounts. He was still holding Wright's cane sword with one hand and his now very bloody knife with the other. The knife fight at the sandbar that day left two dead and another four wounded. But believe it or not, James Bowie was not part of the two deceased. Even after being shot numerous times and stabbed in the chest with a cane sword, James Bowie still went beast mode on his attackers, slicing, stabbing, and living. Ultimately, Colonel Crane, one of Maddox's men, helped carry Bowie away for medical attention. Bowie was recorded as having thanked him, saying his now famous remark, Colonel Crane, I do not think, under the circumstances, you ought to have shot me. One of the doctors who treated Bowie's wounds said this, four stabs and two gunshots. How'd he live is a mystery to me, but live he did. In the early 1800s, many men talked the talk a few walk the walk. Then finally, Jim Bowie was the real deal. Everyone, Tejanos and Texians, seemed to love and respect this man. Jim was fluent in Spanish and a close friend to the Flores brothers, Gregorio Esparza, Carlos Espalier, and many other Tejanos from San Antonio de Bear. But of course, Jim had flaws. Still, he arrived in Texas when Texas needed a robust and fearless leader like Jim Bowie. Bowie inspired many men of our revolution like no other during our darkest moments. James Bowie embodied what the spirit of Texas would become in his lifetime. Therefore, if you ever find yourself in a discussion about who was the baddest man to ever step on Texas soil, don't forget to mention the legend, Jim Bowie, and his legendary fight on a standbar on the Mississippi River. Thank you for being with us today and allowing us to bring you this video presentation entitled the man who brought a knife to a gunfight. I'm Alex Andrew with TVC History. Thanks for watching, and remember, Texas legends, never forget.